Okay, thank you. I always appreciate a podium, because my second biggest fear when I speak before people is my fly is open. So it's nice to hide behind the podium. My first fear is that my phone's going to ring, but I've turned that off, so now I'm uh, ready to go, and I'm delighted to be talking about my favorite subject, which is sales, fundraising. Our, thank you. Our uh, development officer likes to, la likes to call it philanthropy, and I think she's right. However, I, I just have this love for sales, and I've always loved fundraising. When I was chairman of Stetson University, I would always get calls from somebody. There was always some alum who was irritated about something and wanted to talk to me about, shouldn't refer to the university as she, it's a he. Setson is a he, it's not, you know, they talked to me forever and I got even. I mean, the thing that made that job fun is that I would listen to these people and I made sure that they felt that they had been listened to because I really wanted to hear them. And then after they acknowledged that, you know, they have, we'd had a good conversation, I would ask them for a donation, which usually was three times their largest gift to date. And I loved that pause on the phone, you know, when I said, hey, you know, <laughs> we've got this program going, we'd love for you to participate. No, I love fundraising. I think it's the heart of an organization. And so I'd like to share with you, uh, I will be uh, sharing with you about board. So before I talk with you, I'd, I'd kind of like to get a sense of who's here. So how many people here are board members? I know one, oh, wonderful. That's really, and that speaks well for your organization that you would have board members uh, concerned about fundraising. Uh, how many people here are marketing people? Not development people, not, develop, not, not development, marketing. People who uh, position, okay, great. How many development officers? Great, great. Well, uh, let's talk about how to develop uh, fundraising at a board level. And before I begin, I wanna give credit where credit is due. I have learned a lot from these two people and organizations. One is Chuck Lauren. Anybody here have been to one of Chuck's seminars? I strongly recommend him. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable. He's very, very, very high on fundraising. He really knows how to get boards involved. I have used him twice. One, when I was chairman of the uh, Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins, and the other one when I was chairman of the Shares International of Florida Hospital. <clears throat> and he's been very helpful. How many people have attended uh, Rollins Philanthropy, a nonprofit leadership seminar? S so those of you who have been there will agree with me. It's an excellent program, an excellent resource. Uh, you board members, I encourage our boards, my board members to go to their, they have a track for more members that I have found very useful. So what are we gonna be talking about today? I wanna bring out some questions and issues, perhaps so I can be aware of those as, as we move on. Then I want to make the point that where you are as an organization makes a difference as to how you have to approach fundraising in that organization. Uh, then I want to share some best practices for boards. When you look at boards or organizations that raise a lot of money, you usually have organizations the board is involved and I have some very specific ideas that are considered to be best practices. I want to spend the bulk of my talk on that and give you a chance to respond, then <clears throat> what comes out about best fundraising practices for board is that you need to kind of look at your board, create a fundraising culture, and then evaluate your board. So I want to spend a little time on board evaluations. Uh, I have some strong opinions about that. Uh, the next thing is board evaluations usually lead to board recruiting because you, know, you find you need to do a little board turnover, and I want to talk about strategic board recruiting then I want to talk about the chairman's role. I doubt that I will be able to get through everything. I brought more than I can, than I can deal with in an hour. So I just sort of put them in priority and I have some handouts that you can take with you. And hopefully uh, you'll walk away with a couple of uh, ideas that you can work on. So uh, first of all, uh, anybody come here with an issue on, on board fundraising that uh, you wanted to talk, a special, special question or area of interest? You want to share, anyone? Yes, Richard. Uh, Rich. How about uh, jump starting and invigorating a board who's not used to doing development work? That's an excellent question. I think we'll have some that will deal with that. Yes? Uh, we have board of directors for a couple of these kids we need cancer. Yes. So we know for the development side of it that we need to put together another development advisory group. Uh huh. 
Yes. Okay, are they made up of board members only, or do you go outside the board? Um, totally outside the board. Totally outside the board, excellent idea. So your question is, or your issue is, or your, does that work, or how do you work it? Or? All right, okay, that's an excellent move. That's an excellent move. Excellent. Any other questions or issues you all want to talk about? Okay, well, let's go ahead and, and get started. I think where you are in your organizational development makes a difference. I want to talk about organization stage one and stage two, and I'd like for you to, to kind of make a hash mark every time you see something on stage one that uh, sort of reflects your board. And stage one board, founders dominate the board. There are limited sources of funding. Board is involved with a day-to-day -day operation and program delivery. There is a lack of clear board expectations. Often it is personality driven. The founder drives it. The founder and the two or three founders drive it. Uh, directors who serve as grass vol roots volunteers. A director, a board member is usually somebody who's doing face-to-face -face work uh, with the ultimate beneficiary. Lack of a clearly stated future vision, modest or no expectation for board to fundraise, and directors who represent constituencies. A director who's there to represent specific constituency. I want to say real early on, this is not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. And this is what happens when organizations first get started. They usually get started by a visionary, and this is a stage one. How many people here? checked about half or, or more. Okay, so you need to remember that's who you are. That's the state you are. And as you succeed, you're going to be moving in this direction. <clears throat> stage two boards are diversified, have a diversified funding race, funding base. The board is primarily involved in fund development, stewardship, and advocacy. There should be clear board expectations, <clears throat> often, almost always, in writing, almost always in which the board member signs an agreement, an acknowledgement that that's what their responsibilities are. The, the programs are driven by the staff. Staff makes things happen. They're focused on a future vision, a vision that is written, articulated, and pretty specific. There's a functioning, a functioning nominating procedure for bringing people on board, on the board. There's a, there's, a, there's a very specific, there usually is a group of board members called a governing, the governance committee. There have boards that depend on effective standing committees and task forces of the board. In a stage one organization, the board deals with everything at the board meeting. In a stage two organization, the board meets with me, meets with recommendations from the specific standing committees or task forces. Directors are chosen on merit, background, and skills that are related more to fundraising and strategic visioning and organizational planning than they are to delivering, for example, in shares, delivering plastic surgery to our clients. Directors who are selected without a constituency in mind, in fact, directors are chosen with a view, if we get around to it, to broaden the constituencies, and the board focuses on critical strategic issues and direction. How many people here feel that they are on a stage two organization? A couple of people. Okay, so, and how many people feel that they're in between? Good, that's, that's the reality. So there, and you need to understand that because where you are has an impact on how, on the resources that you have, and you can't treat a stage one organization like a stage two organization because it won't work and you can't push through that real quick because it takes more turnover in order to get where you want to go. I do have one handout that you might find useful, you stage one folks might find useful and it's called responsibility of board members. Many times in a stage one board they really aren't aware of all the things that are board. These are best practices uh, of, for successful boards. What we have done in the past uh, in getting a stage one board uh, to see the future is to acquaint them with what the multiple responsibilities are of the board and that sort of broadens their mind because they start saying gee you know we don't do this and that's a fundraising is one of the things that is written there so I'll just give you that 
So be aware that if you're, if you're a stage one and not a stage two, some of the things that I'm suggesting may not work for you yet, but some of the things that I'm suggesting may very well take you where you want to be. So let's talk about board be best practices. One I want to share with you is uh, best practices for fundraising. Uh, I would ask if I were you a yes or a no. It's not to grade yourself as you go, and I hope that you'll pick up maybe one or two things that you can say, hey, you know, I can take that back to my organization and maybe talk to my director or the rest of the board. First, these are best practices that are associated with very powerful fundraising boards. One, there is a strong philanthropic culture, a sense of excitement about the organization's mission and the value of fundraising in achieving that mission. Stage one organization is very high, and they should be, on the benefit that is given, and so they're all excited, I'm gonna go heal the kid, or I'm gonna go recruit this person. F phase two board member is very excited about the organization, but they can't wait to go tell somebody, tell their friends, hey, you know, how about, how about a $50,000 contribution, huh? you know? And obviously, it's not gonna be done that crudely, but they see the value, okay? Philanthropic is a good word, philanthropy. They see the value in promoting philanthropy in the community towards the board. Second, board members are recruited with fundraising in mind. People who see the value and need to raise money. So, when you look for a board member, and you know, organizations that are successful, obviously, they profile and they say, we want people who can fundraise. And one of the things they do in interviewing people is, you know, can you fundraise? And later on, I'll talk about strategic board recruiting, and that will give you an idea but, uh, how to go about that. But board members are recruiting with fundraising in mind. Third, board members are briefed on their fundraising responsibilities before they're selected to the board. They sit down and say, look it, you know, welcome to our board, and here's what we do to fundraise. And they're told and they're, they're, what their expectations is very clear. How many people do here do any one of those three? Okay, so you got some good ideas. <laughs> Stage one organization. Okay, another best practice. There is a board member expectation agreement in which personal giving and fundraising responsibilities are clearly outlined. How many of you do that? If I had one thing to recommend to you, I would say start working there. Start working there, making it very clear to your board what their fundraising responsibilities are. 100% of board members make an annual stretch gift. When I joined Shares, Shares was an organization that was a travel agency with, for doctors that had a huge heart. Plastic surgeons who wanted to fix children's faces with cloth lift and pallets. Florida Hospital said, if our surgeons want to go to Latin America and heal kids, the least we can do is help them get there. So our board was 100% composed of people who were involved in delivering those kind of medical things. And since we were sponsored by Florida Hospital, nobody raised money and very few people donated money because Florida Hospital is richer than God, right? And so at some point, Florida Hospital did the right thing. They said, you know what, shares, you're going to have to start raising your own money. And uh, after we got through the shock, then we moved on. And that forced us to go from, from uh, organization stage one to a stage two, which is the right thing to do for us. It's a wonderful gift they gave us. And the, th the thought of 100% of our board members giving, uh, you know, was, was shocking. How many people here have 100% of their board members giving? That's great. Great. The rest of you, I encourage you. I know it's a tough shift because you have some people who bring a lot to your board who don't give. But that's another, another good stage uh, thing to go for. Uh, this one I have, I have found very useful. Um, I really have found it very useful. You can go to a board member and say, look it, we really expect, we expect you to be involved in fundraising. And, and what we mean by that, we want you to be involved in two out of these three things. First, you choose. One, we would like to be, for you to be involved in cultivating people. What is cultivating people? That's finding people out in the community who might be interested in what you have to offer, get them excited about what you do, and then introduce them to the staff, the fundraising staff. And then not just 
hand it to them and run off, but hand it to them, but hang around long enough to just kind of follow up and make sure that it's moving along. You can cultivate. Two, you can steward. What is stewarding? Well, in the development terminology, stewarding means thanking. Okay, so you can write a personal note on your personal stationery. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your $1,500 contribution to our, to our shares program. Your $1,500 put two new faces and two children in many of the Mexico. Here are the pictures. Thank you. Or three, you can ask. Okay? Most everybody hates to ask. Right? But you can easily talk them into cultivating and thanking, which are huge. So most board members, you can use this as a way to take the pressure out of fundraising. Because when you ask them for fundraising, they, they know what it is. It's about asking for money, and they don't want to do that. Mostly because when you ask somebody, a buddy of yours, to give money to your organization, what usually happens? Huh? No, <laughs> they come back at you for money or theirs. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you lose them. They hate to see you coming, right, Tom? No, but they'll come back and ask you. So people hate to ask. So this is a way of getting around. That's a, that I have found very useful. You sit down with a board member and say, we want you to get involved in fundraising. And say, oh, I'm going to have to ask for money. And you can say two of these three things. Which of those two you feel more comfortable doing? Most people, if they're on your board, surely... They wouldn't mind telling other people how excited they are about the work that you do, and they sure wouldn't mind uh, thanking somebody. And frankly, what I prefer to do is to ask. Because by the time I get to ask, our development staff has already qualified them. They know they're interested. They're already involved. And now it's just a matter of, of making the obvious happen, you know, how are you going to get involved. Asking is really the easiest if you do it right. But it's the one that board members hate to do, so here's a way that you can get around that. The board chair is huge. How many people here are board chairs? Okay. You're a board, I see a board chair over there. She went like that. Are you a board chair? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody. Okay. Uh, board chairs are important in setting the culture, uh, the philanthropic culture. And I'll have a handout later on, on on board chairs. But the board chair takes a strong leadership role in fundraising. The board chair personally solicits board members annually to ensure appropriate board giving. That is usually done unless you have a very, very sophisticated development staff. And, and usually, if, if you have a really super sophisticated, very, very professional, they go ahead and do that. And the board chair doesn't have to do that. Then the board chair can spend their time, her time, uh, you know, fundraising from people who are more on the periphery than, than board people. Although the board chair is involved in asking people to be I, whenever I recruit a board member, uh, I ask them for money. Say one of the mandatories. And our director of development and I shook hands and said, we're not taking anybody on the board that doesn't give a minimum of boom, X amount of money. We swore to each other we wouldn't do it again. That's the kind of, that's the kind of leadership the board chair has to do of support, you know. We have to ask, uh, we have to lead in, in fundraising. And personally it takes time to cultivate and steward appropriate higher level prospects. And for us, that's a major donor. So, I mean, the board chair stays with, with uh, major donors. The board chair, or rather the board fundraising committee, organizes the board's fundraising that, rather than do the actual fundraising. How many people here have a fundraising committee of the board? Okay. If you're a stage two organization, you definitely should have one. If you're a stage one, you should be thinking about forming one. And they usually, the mistake that is made is they say, this is the fundraising committee. So they think, oh, these are the people who fundraise. That's not the case. The fundraising committee isn't there to fundraise. The fundraising committee is to get the board to fundraise. Okay? So they ought to divvy up the board among them and get the message out. The CEO takes time to personally cultivate and steward appropriate higher level prospects and donors. This is hard especially if the CEO has come from the operational side and they think that development is something that's done on the side. Uh, but the CEO, how many of you have directors that are actually making, are involved in, in asking for money? How many of you have directors? Sometimes volunteers run it. How many of you who have executive directors, the di executive director is involved in fundraising for major donors? Uh, and if you're not, I would strongly suggest, you, unless you work for them, <laughs> You might want to suggest it, but organizations that raise money successfully with the boards, uh, the CEO is involved. So not only is the chair involved, 
You're not going to get the board involved unless the CEO is involved and unless the chair is involved. There is a written, clear, concise, and compelling mission statement. If your mission statement is in, in writing, you don't have a mission. That's my radical view. You think you have a vision, you think you have a mission. If it isn't written, you haven't got one. You think you do. 80% <clears throat> of the board members can state the organization's mission statement. Why is this important? Yes? Because if they can't do it, no one else will be able to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how are you going to raise money? You know, you're out there playing golf. What were you doing this? Nestor, what's, what's new with you? Man, I just got back from Mexico. What were you doing in Mexico? I was with an admission. I was with a medical team, and we uh, operated on 50 kits and gave them new faces. Wow, that's fantastic. And then it's my opportunity to say, you know, yeah, it is, because our vision is to partner to heal children and bring them hope. And the way we do that is we partner with local professionals. And together, we establish clinics. There it is. Now I've, I've laid the groundwork. So next time, next time there's an opportunity for a point of entry event, I can get, pick up the phone, hey Joe, remember I, I just, uh, the reason I'm calling you is because I remember, you know, we were out there on the fifth hole and you said uh, shares was sort of a great thing and we're having a little get together on shares and uh, wanted to invite you. Would, you. would you like to come meet some of our volunteers? See how easy it is if, if you know your vision statement? It sort of flows, sort of flows. So 80% of the board members can state the mission's or I don't think ours can. <laughs> so incidentally, don't think for one second that I do you know, we do 100% of these things, okay? Nobody does 100%, but they all work. If you, if you, can, you can pick the ones that are implementable in your organization and work on it, you can make it happen. <clears throat> uh, the first one, this, this third one is related to the first one. Uh, the CEO and development officer identify appropriate cultivation and stewardship opportunities for board members' participation. In other words, it works the other way. Uh, and I get a lot of calls from my development officer. I mean, she will find people everywhere and she say, hey, this person is a develop, you know, this potential major donor, would you come make a call with me? You know? So the CEO and the development officer are actively calling on the board uh, and saying, hey, I've identified somebody, will you come and help me? The CEO and development officer clearly present the organization's fundraising strategy to the board. Uh, you know, if you expect the board to raise funds for you, right, be part, they need to know what your fundraising strategy is. And uh, actually, we practically do that very well. And we practically do it at every board meeting, which is sort of, I mean, the board meeting is, our board meeting, the top priority in our board meeting is fundraising. They get the bulk of the time, not program. And, and our development people take a, make a very good, point of repeating the, the direction, the strategic direction, the fund, fundraising strategy. The CEO and board chair organized the meeting agenda to prioritize the importance of fundraising. Uh, yeah, if you want a fundraising board and you have to have the board talking about fundraising, they can't talk about fundraising when they're talking programs. And if you have a staff that's supposed to be doing programs, then the board really ought not to be involved in the day-to-day -day stuff of programs. Again, if you're a stage one organization, take that with a grain of salt. You're not, you're not going to change that overnight. But if you want to have a fundraising board, <clears throat> you're going to have to talk about fundraising in your board meetings. The CEO and the board chair plan annually for board training opportunities and fundraising. I encourage the board members to go to these uh, philanthropy, Rollins, the Rollins uh, philanthropy program. I mean, I send them there all the time. They had... Uh, they have one program called uh, How to Race a World Class Fundraising Board. I've gone to that. Some of the material I'm sharing with you is what I learned over there, most, a lot of which I've been able to apply. And so uh, I would and strongly encourage you to do that. It's paid off for us. The CEO, the development officer, and the board chair each appropriately publicly acknowledge and recognize board members fulfilling their fundraising. Here's something we do in our board most of the time. We begin the board meeting, <clears throat> early on in our board meeting, we call it success stories, and we go around the board and everybody gets to tell how they helped fundraise since the last time the board met. You talking about pressure? Now, I tell you how, I tell you how this can be, let me go on the negative side first, and then I'll talk about the positive side. The negative side to this is that unless 
you prepare the board for this, it can turn into a disaster because people are going to show up to the board meeting, they're not going to have done anything, and it's going to be a very negative thing. Or they're not going to come. Or they're not going to come. It can be very positive <clears throat> if you make it an absolute essential with a development officer and you say to the development officer, one of your main missions this be be between now and the board meeting is to give our board every opportunity to be involved in some significant fundraising. And before the board meeting, it's your responsibility to call them, to thank them for how they were involved and remind them what they have done <clears throat> to raise money, because board members forget. When do I go off? Okay. <clears throat> How come does your board meet when you tell these success stories? Uh, our board meets every other month. So six times a year. We don't do it every time. Sometimes we cut it out for two reasons. One, we find that it's going to be a very negative meeting because if the development officer says, you know, that not, really not ready to go on that. Uh, but we do it most of the time. At least three times a year we go around. And, uh, and they get to say what they did. And, it, and it's very, po now, on the po I want to end on the positive side. If it's done right, if the development officer calls a board member, calls every board member, and gives them an opportunity to be meaningfully involved, and then if the development officer calls them before the board meeting and thanks them for working with them during the last, last couple of months and reminding them, and don't you want the board member bragging when they do well stuff, and the person who doesn't respond when the, <laughs> when the development officer calls them twice, you know, I think respectfully, they need to just be doing something else if you're serious about getting a, a, a board fundraising. Because one of the things that undermines a board's commitment to fundraising is having people on the board who don't, I mean, devastating is that they don't give. I mean, if you want a fundraising board, the first thing you got to do is get your board to start giving. Uh, and the other thing is board members who just aren't active in fundraising. Okay, and again, I say one more time, if you're a stage one organization, be patient with us. You can't get there overnight. You have to be careful you don't run very dedicated people. We make it a policy never to run anybody off the board. Okay? People will ask out of the board if you do it right. And you treat them respectfully because the key is to put these people, they're usually very, very good hearted people who make significant program contributions, but I just have a hang up about, about, about fundraising and they can find, you can find for them a, a, good, a good place in the organization. I say at a stage two organization, uh, if you're not a fund raising mentality, then you really shouldn't be on that board. Okay, so don't look for it now, but there is a, a handout that I gave you which uh, talks about uh, how to establish a fundraising culture in your board, and that, that handout has most of the ideas that I gave you, if you want to go back and look at them. So how do you evaluate? First, let's talk at what I call the quick and dirty. You take a piece of paper, and you put, you, make, you break it into fours, and in one corner, you put people who are willing to fundraise and able to fundraise, and on the other side, you put willing to fundraise, but not able to fundraise, and then not willing, but able, and not willing and refundable, and fill that space with the members of your board. Where would you place them? Quick and dirty. Your development officer, I mean, is, are they willing or not? So what do you think you're gonna do with these folks? You want to keep them, right? You want to make sure they feel useful. You want to pay attention to them. You want to get them involved. What are you going to do with these folks? Huh? Right, that's right. And you have resources. You can send them to the profit center. You can have a special seminar. You can talk one-on-one. -on -one. You can make it simple. What do you do with these folks? Yeah, you have a conversation with them. You talk about what? Your mission? I mean, they're able to fundraise, they're just not willing, find out why. What do you do with these folks? Thank you for this service. Uh, yeah, and put them on a committee. <laughs> you thank them, yes, they're not, seriously, you thank them for their service and you put them in a committee where they'll be happier, out of the board. You get them out of the board. Uh, with all respect, you have to be so respectful. Uh, these are good people, they're not bad people, they just don't fundraise, they don't want to fundraise, and if you want a stage two board, and if you want to have, have a fundraising board, they can't be on your board. So, board self-evaluation. 
I have a handout for you that, a couple of handouts that go through board evaluation. You can hand them out. No, not hand them out. Uh, I have very strong opinions about uh, board evaluations. I have done two or three of them. Uh, and I have learned from my mistakes. And here's what I believe. First, if you're going to do a board self-evaluation, it's a questionnaire about a board. I handed one out. The first thing, it must be customized. And what I mean by customized is that your board evaluation cannot be used by another organization. It wouldn't work. If you handed it out, it wouldn't work. Why? Because your organization's mission is written in that questionnaire. Your organization's name is in that questionnaire. So first, a board evaluation must be customized. So that when the board member reads it, the board member knows that that is an evaluation for your organization because it can't be used by anybody else. Second, it must be personalized. When we hold board evaluations, I think the board chair needs to meet with every board member after the board member has evaluated and discuss their responses with them. It must be personalized, face to face. Jill, can I, you know, I know you took time. I now have your self evaluation and your board evaluation. Can I come out and have lunch with you and talk with you about how you feel about that? It's personalized. Three, it must be reported. Boards complain that they go through all this self-evaluation process that looks like somebody just pulled off a, a seminar they just went to, doesn't even relate to the board. Nobody ever talks about them, and nobody ever reports it. Can you believe people do that? Can you believe people hand a, a mem member board? They do. People do. I've seen it. Give board member eva self-evaluations that could be used for any organization. Never call them about it and never report it. And, and if you do those three things, uh, they will work. And what, what happens? What happens is the four corners sort of, sort of define themselves. And this is a wonderful opportunity for you to talk about people about the importance of fundraising and find areas uh, where they can be motivated and work with. And that's what we tell them. You know, when we do this, we go to our board members and say, you know, tell me what you really like because, you know, if, we want you doing stuff that you really like, and we want you to really be motivated in your work you do for shares, the work you do for the university, the work you do for the museum. What is it that you really like to do? What are, what, which of our standing committees would you prefer to work on? It's a great way to have a face-to-face, -face, comfortable conversation with a board member. And of course, when you read the handout, fundraising will be all over there. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's a good way to get the board. So, board self-evaluation. If you have a board evaluation, what you're eventually going to do is going to revamp the board. Uh, we had one uh, couple, three, three years ago, I guess it was. Uh, you know, I just came to the conclusion, if we're going to have a fundraising board, we're going to have to turn over the board. If it, because the folks there just weren't going to raise money. It, they were good people, just not going to raise money. And so if you're going to turn over the board, uh, I have a handout that talks about board, building cycle, board building cycles. Uh, I found it very useful. It gives you an idea. Uh, and, you rate, and what you basically are doing is you're, you're, you're building your board constantly. Uh, there's a board profile worksheet that I've handed out. Basically, you need to customize that. The first step is to get your board to analyze itself. It talks about different things. It talks about dem uh, demographics like gender, age, where they live. It also talks about areas of expertise. And the board just kind of checks some of those categories. And then, as a, then you, what will happen is you'll begin to see areas where your strength, you have a lot of doctors on the board, don't have enough business people on the board, you have a, a lot of Hispanics on the board, but you haven't got enough Anglos on the board. But you'll find out where your strategic holes are, if I could say that. And so then you can use your recruiting, your board recruiting, target it to the people that you really need on your board. So the worksheet is just the beginning to give you ideas, but if you use the worksheet right, you will put in your own categories because you will know what your organization is and you will know what you're looking for. And, and, uh, and then you'll find what the you'll be thinking about what kind of people do we need to add to our board and that's a strategic. So people don't, so the people that get on the board are not the ones somebody finds, hey, Joe wants to be on the board. And we, we have done that and it really works. Uh, and we were looking for fundraising people, people who had money. And we started looking for fundraising people and people who had money. And when you start looking for them, sooner or later you're going to get them. I also handed out uh, 
a review, the, the last worksheet that we did with our board, it's a last handout. You'll see it. In, it's a grid. You'll see it. And it's got yellow. And basically what happened, those yellow lines were the ones that became our strategic uh, profile for the kind of board members we were looking for. So I just gave you one. That reflects us and tell, you know, you might get an idea. But again, like the board evaluation, this worksheet will work best if you customize it. Not if you just take it and use it, but it's a good, it's a good tool. Just uh, want to go through this real quick. Uh, the board chair in fundraising. A uh, board chair is responsible for really for the culture. Board chair needs to uh, write the big gift. Uh, let me just say that. That's a stretch gift. Uh, I think a stretch gift is, is a better word than a big gift. A stretch gift is a gift that I have to go home and talk to Donna about. Okay? <laughs> That's a stretch gift. And, and, and that number may be bigger or smaller than somebody else's number. But that's what a board chair does. Board chair goes home and talks to their spouse and say, you know, I'm thinking I want to make this kind of a gift. What do you think? That's a stretch gift. So it's, uh, that's what we mean by uh, a significant gift. Place fundraising on the meeting agenda as a priority. Solicit each board member for their personal gift. Again, if, if you're a highly developed level two organization like Stetson University or Florida Hospital uh, Foundation, board chair is better off raising money from somebody that doesn't know the organization that somebody's already on the board. Ensure adequate staff support and staff resources for fundraising. Uh, when you're making budgets and when you're setting priorities, a board chair is an advocate for the development staff. Be available for donor stewardship and solicit solicitation. Uh, recruit a competent fundraising chair and appoint a strong committee uh, for fundraising. Uh, make time on the meeting agenda for fundraising education. Uh, champion an annual board retreat that includes time for fundraising. Here, the, the chair takes the leadership in this. Uh, last two, uh, be certain that board recruits individuals willing to fundraise. Thank you all very much for your attention. Hope Thank you have you, a great sir. day. Thank you.